Ready. That's me and you go toe to toe on a trail race, Rob. Ready, s- ready, set, go. <laughs> Rob Archuleta. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Hey man, I just first yeah. off, first of all, I just want to thank you for like the hospitality today. We've had a wonderful day, like hanging out at the gym and like cool. getting to know your people. And your wife uh, was very hospitable and stuff. So cool, uh, cool. Awesome, awesome time. Awesome. Right out of the gate, I just wanted to ask you: um, number one, how you met Caleb, and number two, what your first impression of him was. Okay. Cool. Well, I met Caleb. Um, I saw this video of him in a cage and Sarah McLaughlin was singing. <laughs> and uh, it was like, for the price of a cup of coffee, you could help save Caleb. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. No, I met, um, I met Tom Shanahan from Spiritual Adrenaline first. And uh, Tom's just such a great guy and he's such an advocate for the active recovery movement and just so passionate about what he does. And talk about a guy that just really has no agenda other than helping people's lives. And that's hard to find because there's a lot of people out there doing stuff similar to what we do, but they're really protective over their model and really protective over, and I get it, you have to have a business and in order to help people, you got to make money and have money. But Tom has always been really transparent and willing to make those connections. And so after Tom had met Caleb and met us, I mean, he was just relentless on trying to put us together and, um, you know, tying us together. And unfortunately, I've been in school, it seems like, for years. I'm doing my PhD. I was in my master's <laughs> program then. And uh, Tom said, hey, Caleb, this kid is uh, running like a thousand miles in 30 days or whatever. And, you know, like a lot of people hit us up with stuff like mm-hmm. that, you know, and, and sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's exaggerated. So I kind of started following Caleb, and then I'm like, no, this dude's really doing it. Do you know what I mean? And so uh, I had kind of talked to Tom about going out there and running like a couple days with you, Mm -hmm. and then I think you cut it a little bit short, right, like at 700 or something like that? And so then Tom was like, well, uh, he cut it a little short, because I was going to try to go when he Mm -hmm. went. But we just, our schedules have just been hectic, and and last year was a very trying year for us, so we just couldn't get out there. But the first thing I thought of a lot, you know, and I... This is going to sound really narcissistic to say this, but I was like, man, he reminds me of me like when I first got clean, just driven and out there trying to think of the craziest thing you could do, you know, (laughs) you know, because when I first started this, like I went, I did a 5K, then a half marathon and then like a half Ironman in that order. Like I did a 5K and then a half marathon was my next race, which was like a five hour half marathon. But it was, (laughs) yeah, I just figured like, I was like, how much further can those miles be. And I think you kind of had that same mentality. So I kind of was like, hats off to him. I hope that, uh, I did, I did know we were going to meet up. So I just thought mm-hmm. you were just, I thought you were inspirational. It kind of reminded me of where, where we started and it was fun watching you. Thanks, it's, it's been fun watching you. Yeah. It's exactly yeah. how, it's exactly how he <laughs> yeah. started. Yeah. 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 Similarity. Yeah. 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 I actually on. done a half Ironman seven weeks out of jail. So yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Like straight me. from, going to being an active addiction to spending that time in jail to seven weeks later, <laughs> and yeah. then not even getting that much swimming and yeah. I'm ba- backstroking and doggy paddle <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> good though that's but you kind of have that mentality when you first get out yeah. you're like if the drugs didn't take me water's not gonna take me <laughs> exactly you know, so. exactly yeah <laughs> so um in your process of recovery like what was the when did this fitness part like caleb's entered it right away and you started like so, entering these races and stuff. Like what was that transition it, like for it, you, like so discovering that? I think that, and I talk about this in treatment all the time. I think that people there's, it's taboo to talk about, but, but, um, some people, everybody seems to gain a little weight when they get sober. And for some people that's really good. And for some people it's bad. And just, um, you know, I didn't want, I, it was funny cause I was started working in, treatment right away right out and I was working in a recovery prevention and I used to teach a parenting class and there was a sign on the door and it had this guy and it said stop smoking after you get sober and and the sign was a guy in a muscle shirt and it said I didn't quit doing meth so the the Marlboros could get me do you know what I mean and I kind of I kind of like it resonated with me because I was like (laughs) man I I don't want to be the guy that's like I quit doing meth but the carbs got me uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I just really, and, and oh, just, I, I think it's for me in recovery, I like spirituality and I like exercise because it's a tangible and achievable goal with no finish line. 
Like you never hit spiritual <laughs> awareness where you're like, ah, oh, okay, I'm, I'm done I'm with here, that. I've yeah. arrived. Yeah. yeah. I crossed the Christian finish line and now yeah. I'm moving to Buddhism. <laughs> right? So you always could be closer to God or closer to on your spiritual journey. And even though finishing a workout is tangible, at the same time, you could always go harder, further, and faster. So in recovery, I think that we all love to have that reward center of our brain light up. And we always are looking for that carrot to chase. Because I always tell people, you know, everybody's bored when they get sober. But that's because you're driven by addiction. You know, nobody's bored in addiction because you always have something to do, something to achieve. Get more, hustle, do whatever. And I think in recovery, it's the same way in exercise. You always could go further. You always get, I wake up in the morning, just like an addiction. I always had a drive. What are you going to do? I don't know. We got to get something. Yeah. And in sobriety, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to go work out. You have that same plan. And, and I think exercise teaches you discipline and it also te- teaches you commitment. It teaches you self-care and love. Mm-hmm. And it also teaches you what it's like to overcome goals yeah, every day. Yeah, yeah. Perseverance. Yeah. That, um, you know, talking about the active sober community and, and how like a lot of uh, recovery pathways and programs look at that as an outside issue. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I see like the people that take their fitness and their nutrition serious, like really thriving. You know what I mean? Yeah. Doing, yeah. Knocking out these big goals and everything. And from going to, I mean, coming to the CrossFit gym and like you're doing, I'm mean, getting your PhD. Yeah. I mean, it really yeah. does. It, it, it teaches that perseverance and endurance and how to overcome different challenges it, and everything. So, so when I, so I'm no longer affiliated with Addict to Athlete. I haven't been a part of Addict to Athlete since 2006, 2019, 16, sorry, 2016. And Sheena's been running it. But when, when I created it early in my recovery, we used a five, we used a five pointed star as our logo and it stands for God, self, society, service, and fitness. So Mm -hmm. God first is the middle of the star, self taking care of yourself, service helping others, society doing what society expects from you, and then fitness. And so we had this really holistic approach to God, self, society, service, and fitness. If you could hit those five things, you're not just going to survive addiction and be in recovery, but you're also going to flourish. And I think it's important to say, like, recovery has two negative things about it, right? Like, number one, is when you say someone's in recovery, we generically use it as abstinence. Mm -hmm. And you could be sober and not recovering anything. And so when you're in recovery, you're recovering the things you lost in addiction, wellness, health, education, trust, family, all of these things. So being sober isn't enough. you got to recover all the things you lost. The other negative thing about recovery, or the, the word or term recovery, is recovery implies that something was good, And then it went bad, and now it's good again, right? So I'm in recovery from addiction. But some of our people will never be in recovery because they were born into a life of addiction. They were born into a life. So there's nothing to recover from. Those people aren't in recovery. They're reborn. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So when we say, like, you're in recovery, and they're like, from what? I was born into this world, you know? And they were born into addiction. So so the idea of recovery... It really does imply to clinicians, probation officers, parole officers, AA, NA, the 12 steps. It, it really implies you had a normal life, you got into addiction, and now you have a normal life again, so you're in recovery. But for somebody who was born into a life of gangs or on the reservation, born into you know, addiction, poverty, and it's generational, they're not in recovery. We're actually asking them to be reborn. Yeah. And so Thanks. I think that we got to be careful how we use that word recovery. Because we get with probation officers, parole officers, judges, whoever, and we're saying, like, we want you to be in recovery. And they're like, I don't even understand what you're asking of me. Right. Do you know what I mean? So so we've kind of like our models have changed. The more educated we become, the more people we meet. I think that the important thing, what I don't like about the 12 steps is they're not fluid. And what I do like about, you know, the 12 steps is they're structured. But I feel like you have to be fluid and move with people and be able to be willing to meet them where they're at in their recovery. Transparent. Yeah. You talked about the spirituality piece. Mm -hmm. How do you blend the two together, the spirituality and the fitness? (sighs) So in treatment, it's very different. Like at Crossroads, we get court appointed people. And so um, we don't we get we have Celebrate Recovery, which I'm sure you're familiar with Celebrate Mm -hmm. Recovery. So we, we offer that to clients. We offer them the Zen of Recovery, which is a Buddhist model. Like we offer them every kind of 
anything that they want, right? But because we have core <coughs> appointed people, we can't push and we don't want to push any religious thing on any religious aspects mm-hmm. of or just any theology on them whatsoever. Right. We just want to say, here's the plate, choose from whatever you want to eat. Um, in A to A, we kind of use principles of Zen because um, I think Zen, you know, Buddhism is not necessarily a religion, it's more of a philosophy. And for me, and like I think a lot of people that get sober, like the only reason I knew I believed in God is because I hated him and I was mad at him. Mm -hmm. And practicing the principles of Zen and looking at how all these different philosophies, it quieted my mind long enough to be able to understand and hear Christianity or to hear Jesus' voice. I call myself a Christian because everything Jesus said created a, l- created a little bit of space for you it to did, hear it. It did, it did. Created, you're, that's exactly a good way to say it. It created space so I could hear it. Yeah. And so I'm pretty sure that Jesus I believe in is not like, wait a minute, you found Jesus? You found me through Buddhism? <laughs> like... But go back. That's actually, no, I'm just joking. Yeah, actually, that's Start actually over. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Caleb, it's something yeah. me and yeah. Caleb have been talking about a lot lately yeah. is the, the blend between the two and how to... <clears throat> so I've been, I've been involved with the refuge recovery community mm. since day one, which is a Buddhist pathway to recovery yeah. as well. Um, and one of the things that like one of my teachers said early on, like early recovery was like, the more you do this, what tends to typically happen is the more you apply these spiritual principles, the more you begin that daily meditation practice, it will kind of create that space yeah. and open you up. And, and the majority of people find themselves being drawn back to like whatever their original belief systems were prior to right. substance use or so, whatever. So that's, so you got the four noble truths, right? Four and noble then, truths, eightfold path. That's so then when you get on the eightfold path, the first one mm-hmm. is right understanding mm-hmm. and people that are born with traumas or sexual abuse or violent traumatic experiences in their life, sometimes right understanding is going to open that door to spirituality. Because if you hold resentments because of those traumatic experiences or childhood experiences, those resentments will keep you distant from God. Mm -hmm. And then once you have that right understanding and you start to get that, you're like, okay, I understand. I understand why this happened. Or maybe your understanding is there's never going to be an answer good enough. Do you know what I mean? But once you get that, then that opens up, it creates that space and opens up that, it opens really, I guess, opens up your heart and your mind because you're not full of resentment. And then once you're not full of resentment, other things seem like, they just seem clearer. Yeah. So yeah. So I think uh, two things that we teach in, in every program that I'm involved with is right understanding and right purpose. Those are the two for me. And right effort. You know what I mean? It's, so. And it's beautiful how they're all interconnected, yeah. how they all work together. Right. You got to be able to do one to, with the other and stuff, yeah. not as a, a linear path like right. some of the other fellowships out there. What was the other two you said? Right, 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 right. I mean, there's eight of them, right? But the uh, right purpose, right understanding, and, uh, you know, right purpose, right understanding, and right effort, I think, are the big ones for people in recovery because... So let me give you, like, I'll just tell you a story. Do you guys want to hear it? Yeah, yeah. So, so once upon a time, there was this kid. No. <laughs> so um, I was counseling this, this veteran one time. Like, I used to go volunteer at the War Hero Hospital. And we were talking about this. We were doing the Zen of Recovery, and we're talking about right understanding. And so he was like, he got really mad and hostile. And he was like, you know, my Humvee rolled over an IED. He's like, the guy next to me had four kids and believed in Jesus. And he was like, what's the right understanding in that? Explain that to me because I will never be able to live until I understand that. And so the whole group worked on it. It's not like I had the answer. But what, what the flaw in his thinking, what the group came up with, was the flaw in his thinking was that because this guy had four kids and loved Jesus, that his life had more value than his life. Mm-hmm. So that was the first part of his right understanding. The second part and third part of his right understanding was in combat people die. The other one was that the IED didn't know who has kids and who doesn't. Do you know what I mean? And so we really started to work on this, this point of right understanding, like how do you move past this? And for him, like just knowing that his life had the same value as his buddy's life or that he sat on the left side instead of the right side. And sometimes it's just as simple as for him, it was like, he started to understand that his life had value, that it, it wasn't unfair. Because what we really need, in my opinion, my humble opinion, with right understanding, is that we have to take ourselves out of it 
As long as our perspective is a part of it, we will never have right <laughs> understanding. And that's what he was doing. He was saying that it was unfair. And when he like really started to work with the group and talk about his kids and his family, then that right understanding started to come into, into uh, it started to come into focus for him. And I thought that was like the first time that I ever saw right understanding really work in an intense situation. Um, another veteran that I was counseling, he was a, a Navy SEAL and he was volunteering at this hospital where he was on a mission and he didn't have contact with his family for something like a year. And his daughter got uh, really, pro- really progressive cancer, fast moving cancer. And she died in that year that he was gone. And when he came back, we did that right purpose and, and, and our right understanding. And the right understanding that he came up with was that no matter how many times he fell on his knees and yelled at God, he wasn't ever going to get an acceptable answer. So for him, his right understanding was, I'm just not going to get an answer, so I'm going to stop beating my head against the wall asking. Because like what one of the guys in the group said, well, pretend I'm God and your daughter died of cancer. What answer is good enough? What, what could I tell you? That would make you feel better. Right. And he was like, nothing. You can't tell me anything. He's like, then you have to stop asking. If there's never going to be an acceptable answer, maybe your right understanding has to be that I'm going to stop asking. And so it's diff- the great wow. thing about that is it's different for everybody. Mm-hmm. But sometimes my right understanding is like, why am I gaining weight? And then I look at the empty jar of peanut butter and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's why. <laughs> so it could be as complex as losing a child to cancer, as simple as why is the scale numbers going up, you know? So... Yeah, and it's a beautiful thing to be able to like work through that in a group dynamic and yeah. be able to like right. open yeah. your perspective yeah. to things that you not, might not necessarily be looking at. Yeah, or think that you're like yourself yeah. out of yeah. it, like Psyching you said. Yourself out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hearing, hearing uh, the opinions <clears throat> of others. You know, that's the whole point of. And that just goes back to how expectations <laughs> and and perspectives you know lead to disappointment a lot of times. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I tell everybody hey, though, you want the path to relapse, it's called expectations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Like, my first three sponsors relapsed and I was like, this program sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, I put a post up the other day and it said uh all the things that you're entitled to in this world and yeah. there's a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good though. That's right. Yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. Those entitlements, expectations and things. Yeah. So at what point did you start working in the field of treatment so i started the crazy thing was like i started in prevention and recovery so i was really able to work with addict to athlete and people in recovery but as my as my education got further and the and my credentials changed and then my position in going from somebody that's a peer and this is important to know because everybody that gets sober goes i want to be a counselor and being a clinician and being a peer recovery coach are two different things because once you get into being a clinician then you got to look out for dual relationships, which means no more coaching, no more sharing stories about personal opinions or personal experiences. And then you're protected by HIPAA. There's no putting them in your car and giving them a ride home. So you have to choose, like, do I want to work in treatment or do I want to work as a peer navigator or a peer recovery coach? And for Sheena, she was like, I don't want to further my education. I want to be a peer coach. I want to be one of them. And for me, I wanted to further my education because I think to truly to truly, truly implement change, somebody like me has to be a PhD and has to be at the level of making policies in the government. And so for me, I wanted to be a policymaker and I was willing to put my story, my, my personal experiences aside and work in the treatment field. And I think it's important to know that because once you start getting protecting by HIPAA, protecting your credentials, I mean, I'm going to have a $150,000 PhD. The last thing I want to do is anything to jeopardize that by having some weird dual relationship with a client. So I don't <laughs> mind. And, and when I say dual, I don't mean like personal relationship, but even working out with a client can be considered a dual relationship. Yeah. So you can't give them a ride, which is tough because I used to do groups and I'm like waiting for the last person to leave and it's snowing outside and you know that person only needs a ride down the street, but everything about, you know, being credentialed as a counselor says you can't put them in your car. Right. And they're looking, at, like, they're looking at you like, you don't care about me. What mm. kind of counselor are you? And you're like, uh, I wish I could give you a ride, but I can't, you know? And so then you really, like, if you're passionate about it, you really feel your heart being ripped out. But at the same time, 
if you lose or you or you do that, you put yourself at risk. And who knows? You know what I mean? Like our clients are in vulnerable situations. They could accuse you of something. You could get in a car accident on the ride home. Right. Do you know what I mean? They could make up a story. Like you just don't know. And you know. And at the same time, you don't want to do for one client that you don't do for all the clients because then yeah. it shows favoritism. So it's really like. You have to decide early, do I want to be a recovery coach or do I want to further my education and be a counselor? Because the paths are very different. And there's times when it bothers me. Like, I'm like, did I do the right what? thing? <laughs> She's getting ready to go into, uh, I mean, yeah. you've been talking about going into counseling, haven't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well... And her heart, like, she's got such a compassionate yeah, heart for people. Yeah. So I know that's going to be, <laughs> like, as, she, as you're talking, her eyes are just like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hard, dude. It's hard. Like, it's, and it's hard because especially in treatment, you're using evidence-based practices. And it's crazy because I just did this class on ethics and values. Some states say that you could use your personal story to gain trust with clients. Other states say don't share anything because it's considered inappropriate. Right. So you got to learn that you, what your state finds acceptable too. But treatment and recovery are two totally different things. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like being a physical therapist that helps somebody with a knee issue and, and then being the doctor that did the knee replacement. Right, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you got to decide, do you want to do the knee replacement <coughs> or do you want to be the one teaching them to walk again? Because the oh, knee replacement good. doesn't get the glory. Do you know right. what I mean? You're yeah. the one in treatment that they actually hate at times. And then they go to AA and NA, and they're like, my sponsor did everything for me. He helped me. Do you know what I mean? And that's kind of how the physical therapists get all the glory. You helped me walk again. And meanwhile, there's some doctor behind closed doors that actually did the right. knee replacement. Yeah. So as a, as a counselor, but as I got older, I really don't mind taking the back seat. I like that Sheena's out in the open and, and that she's out there. And it's awesome to see an, uh, a woman out there leading that too, so... There's a healthy balance with what's all going on here, like to right. be able to have both sides of the. Yeah, of the yeah, yeah. It is. I don't. I hope that one day I'm, I'm, you know, you know, in the government making policies and laws that, you know, I hope I'm looked at it as an expert in treatment and recovery services and creating funding and creating programs. That's what I want to do. And we need yeah. people like yeah. that, and you know, working their way up like that. And yeah. We don't have enough people. Do you do you see a lot of people like in in the same same position that you're in? No PhD level that's in recovery. So so yeah. I'm gonna give a shout out. I have a buddy called No. His name is Noel Vest. I knew him when I lived in Vegas. He has a program uh, that he does, and it's called uh, Prison to PhD. Oh, sure. And so nice. like wow. he has some PhDs and and really helping them get funding because it's hard. Uh, I'm I'm grateful that I didn't have awesome. this, but it's hard to get financial aid when you've been a prisoner or had drug charges because right. they're not trying to finance your next hookup. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> You're filling out the FAFSA form. The first thing it says is, have you been busted with drugs? And if you say yes, they're like, go see a counselor. It kicks you out of the system immediately. So, but um, there are people in recovery. Uh, every year I go to this collaborative justice conference and one of the lawyers and, and the advocates that speaks for the whole state, he's a recovering heroin addict and it's pretty amazing to see somebody at, with his stature up there and, and I started going to this conference I was like that's what I want to do I'm willing to sacrifice those little personal relationships and those personal feel good moments to, to hopefully be in a position one day to change the culture of treatment and yes. the culture of recovery so that's, that's what my goal is what kind of advocacy work are you doing now currently so um, right now harm reduction is the big thing uh, and so mm -hmm. that's what yeah so harm reduction is tough to wrap your mind around, right? Because you're... What are the, well, what are the laws like here? Because I'm sure they're totally different than back home. So in Colorado, we just switched on, um, on March 3rd, 2020. Possession will, always, will only be a misdemeanor. Okay. So they've gotten rid of the felonies for drug possessions. Wait, wait, wait. Any possession? Um, as long as it's, it's not, not like just trafficking weight? Well, if you have weight, heavy weight, it's or... What, what, possession. Is it? what is the... What is, yeah, what is it's it? probably, I think it, they haven't specifically Quarter said ounce. everything. Yeah. But it's like nine grams <laughs> or something like, like wow. 3.5 or, or, so. or separated baggies. And it just depends how they then catch you. Comes. Yeah. If they catch you with the scale, I'm pretty sure you're not going <laughs> to, <laughs> that's not possession. Yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure you're doing yeah. right with that. So, but, um, but the advocacy that work that I'm doing, I'm part of this program at Crossroads. It's called the lead law enforcement assisted diversion program. So when somebody's about to get arrested, yes. um, they go and they're diverted. And so I'm in charge of that program. I, I did this, the, the, 
the pitch for it for Crossroads to get it, and we got it. And so it's pretty interesting to be working with those clients and providing them case management. And as and it, and it really has changed my mind because when I first got sober, I was so hardcore. I'm like, you're either in or out. Like you're either <laughs> in this or you're out of this. Make a decision, you know. And now I see like you could be on methadone, you could be on. Right. You know, you know, you could be drinking. You maybe you want to do smoke weed, but get rid of the heroin. And at that point, you kind of have to decide: Do you want to save a life, or do you want to push an agenda? And right. for so long, I was pushing an agenda, and now I'm just like, I just want to save lives. Right? You There's, can't yeah. save somebody that's dead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dead pe- dead people don't get sober. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're you don't get a chip for methadone if you're you know. But now I'm like, <laughs> I, dude, oh, like man. yeah. If I hate that happens to people yeah. too. Yeah. So we were uh, driving in last night, like midnight to one o'clock in the morning, and uh, <laughs> we had just we had just listened to like one of your talks, I think, on harm reduction, yeah. and literally like two miles across the border, there's like dispensaries on oh, the yeah, street yeah, from yeah. each other. So I wanted to ask you like how recreational cannabis has influenced either positively or negatively there's harm reduction modalities. In so this, in so this let me just say this. You know what I'd really like to see a study on? Everybody's doing study on, oh my God, CBD oil. This kid had seizures every day and he smoked a joint and now his seizures went away. Like everybody wants to see those studies. I want to see a study on how it affected our community, how, how the economics of the community changed. That's what I would really love to see because I think it's been positive. Like, you know, it's been good for the development of businesses and, and you know, anything like that is good. People were smoking pot anyway. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I just don't care. Here's, here's how I feel about pot. Is I feel that people that smoke pot aren't really committed to true addiction. No, I'm just kidding. I don't say, <laughs> no, but people... <laughs> like, you, I, I see pot smokers and I'm like, dude, step it up. Just commit. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. No, uh, all in or all yeah, out. Yeah, all in or all out. Stop it. Um, if you can't shoot up pot, no. So what I... Uh, so, no... So I always say this about pot because I think we have to be honest about it, especially when we're talking with kids, you know, like, because I don't want to tell you pot's the devil. Oh, yeah. And here then, we go. This is yeah. good. And then you say, if you think pot's the, and then they think you're lying, pot's not the devil, then they're going to think you're lying about meth too, right? Yeah. So my thing with pot is this, is I always tell people, pot's not going to drown you, but it's not going to get you to shore either. Correct. So if you're happy not progressing, or I always say, you know what pot cures? Because everybody's like, pot cures this. I go, it cures motivation. And so um, I just think if you're okay just treading water in life and you don't want to move forward or backwards, I think pot's a great drug for you. Um, my, my issue with this is that the, the drugs that have been illegal historically are mind-altering drugs. Mm-hmm. And when, when your mind is altered, it's, it's who, it's, you know, your brain is the great thing inside of your head. But your mind is who you are spiritually, yeah. what your values are, ethically, your, your priorities. are. That's your mind. And any time you do a mind-altering substance, those priorities, those values, those things change. So is pot the devil? No, but pot is a mind-altering substance. And you wouldn't do it if it wasn't. So my problem with pot is that people that are into pot are into pot every day. So like they use a mind-altering substance almost every single day as a way to just live. And then when they want to party, they do something else, like drink or do other drugs. So now they got two mind-altering substances in their system. So it's kind of hard to get a, a read on where pot really is. And I know one thing that Colorado was not prepared for is we weren't prepared to see how we were going to handle DUIs with pot. We weren't prepared to see how strong the edible is going to be. And we weren't prepared for the vaping of marijuana. And so, you know, I think there was a lot of things we weren't ready to regulate because you have, I'm sure the emergency room and I have some nurses that work out here that are like, my grandma ate a marijuana cookie and she can't breathe. Do you know what I mean? Like, and and it's, so it's happening a lot. Oh yeah, it's happening. (laughs) Have you ever heard the phone call of that cop? Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's like, we're dead. We're dead. Do you know what we're talking about? Uh -uh. No. So this cop confiscated brownies, brownies yeah. from uh somebody and then he calls 911 and the calls like went viral he's like i'm a police officer and we confiscated these brownies and we ate them me and my girlfriend and he's like we're dead we're dead, we're dead. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just wigging out right <laughs> and so we weren't ready for that and it's funny because bill maher just told a story on howard stern about edibles freaking him out 
And I saw an interview with Snoop Dogg where they go, do you eat edibles? And he goes, no. And they go, why don't you eat edibles? He goes, because edibles don't have an off button. You know? <laughs> yeah. And so Colorado wasn't ready for these really potent edibles. Joe Rogan and Joey Diaz are always talking about staying away from the edibles. Yeah. 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 When you got guys like that, like, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know, <laughs> Joe Rogan literally uh, got that dude from Tesla in trouble for smoking yeah. weed, right? And then he's like, but don't do edibles. <laughs> you know? So, but, but, so the way now I, I in that harm reduction thing that you were talking about, um, the presentation I did at the Collaborative Justice Conference, I quoted some statistics and, and, mm-hmm. and opioid, opioid overdoses went down a small percent. It was like 0.10%, but it did go down with the legalization of marijuana. Wow. I think a lot of people... Have Wait, like, how much? Did it, it was go? like very small, like 0.10%. So it's not making that much of a... You know, no, I mean, it's not, but it did make some of a difference. Do you know what I okay, mean? Okay, so you said... That's for what, overdose rate? Yeah, right. it was like what the overdose What about crime changed. rate? Did yeah. that go How's up or anything? Rate? So I don't know because I don't think we were really arresting on marijuana or charging for marijuana anyway. Right. So I think it kind of, I don't think we really saw it. Nobody's anything. kicking in doors, breaking in houses to go get their edibles? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, now, okay, I want to ask you this: Like, when have you have you had an um, opportunity to speak to any students? And if you did, yeah. how would you present the gateway drug conversation? And, yes, yeah, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Cut it>. cringe. <laughs> yeah. So I don't. I hate that. Like, uh, no, yeah. like, <laughs> well, here's what I always say: I go in the in the history of of my life, which has only been forty six years, but I've never met anybody that smoked pot and then just stopped there yeah i've never met anybody that that smoked one joint and was like that's it that's what i've been looking for i'm never gonna do anything (laughs) else ever again i've never met that person now they might exist so but then at the same time i think that uh oh god it's so tough i everything's a gateway do you know what i mean is I it's think your behavior pleasure game. pleasure, pleasure. pleasure. Yeah. I think any antisocial behavior is a gateway to more antisocial behavior. You know, and when I say antisocial, I mean anti-society, because anytime you do something that's considered antisocial, well, let's be honest, most antisocial, like a lot of things, are fun that are antisocial or or bring you pleasure, and so you know, it's like saying it's linked but not linked. Like right, so marijuana is a gateway to other drugs. Do you know what I mean? Does that mean every addict, you know, uh, smoked pot before they did their other drug? It's like saying pornography is the gateway to child pornography. It probably is somewhere, but not every single person that watches pornography gets into child por- pornography. Not every single person that um, smokes pot gets into heroin or meth. But I do believe that once you open that door and see what's available or once you open your mind to mind altering experiences and why wouldn't you be like, if you smoke pot and you're like, damn, this is great. Why wouldn't you be interested in other drugs? Right. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I for sure truly would put money that most people that smoked pot did shrooms. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm I don't know sure. why. That's a random question. No, All the viewers sure. out there, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or wear Birkenstocks. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> So since you brought up antisocial, yeah, 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 that was a, that was a good that was a good discussion. Since like you brought that, up yeah. antisocial behavior, mm. I wanted to thank you for topic of tonight's group. Okay. Yeah. It's extremely yeah. appropriate and extremely timely for these two down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something that gets brought yeah, with up with everything, yeah. with everything, even you know, even the whole spiritual part of it. You know, it. Yeah. And I, I've been, you know, I've been thinking about <laughs> this about how uh, sometimes I, I, I over spiritualize things. That's true, Caleb. You do. <laughs> I just met you yesterday. I, yeah, I, just, I was teasing Caleb that uh, he hashtags Jesus so much that Jesus is like, between Caleb and Tebow, I can't sleep, man. This guy's got to st- stop tagging me and stuff. Caleb, I'm, I'm competing with Tebow. Yeah. I'm competing with Tebow. Yeah. I, I, no, but uh, me and Tom are talking about that. I'm like, man. Oh, my gosh. Like, I love Jesus too, Caleb, but dang, man. <laughs> no, you do over, but it, that's okay though. And, it, and I, yeah. I realize that, and that, no, I'm no. growing, and I see no. that. Yeah. But you know what? I think that it's like when you're when you're reborn as a Christian and reborn as an athlete or so sober. If everything in in your life is a spiritual experience, that's a gift. 
Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just don't tag us in it. No, I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Stop just putting kidding. it on my wall. No. <laughs> it, 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 I'm going to go to hell and Jesus is going to be like, you know what? You were on your way up till you told Caleb to stop tagging me. And stuff. <laughs> no, it, I think it's okay. I think it's okay that you did that. But I do think that that, that uh, what we were talking about antisocial behaviors was leisure and recreation. Like, mm-hmm. what do you do for leisure and recreation? And I think recreation, the exercise piece ties into that, but what are you doing for leisure? Do you know, well, like you, you know, said? Well, you know, so something that was cool that I didn't think about until afterwards was, uh, and it, I'm glad that you brought it up because it turned some wheels in my head, like, hey, maybe you need to try it out. When I was on uh, house arrest, I had no, I mean, 24 hour, could not go anywhere, had to stay at home house arrest so i learned how to play a banjo and because I, I had so much time on my hands and it i love it you know but i've been putting that off and i could you know that was fun yeah. for me i love doing no, that yeah. and and that could be you know next time i can have a concert over here at the gym <laughs> 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 well don't uh, let be, me don't just get jealous no let now. me just ask <laughs> you this was that the only thing in the house like, how did no. you pick a banjo of all things? Uh, mom. My mom. Have you been yeah. to Cherokee? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come yeah, on. You've been, you been to Swain County? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that a big, is that a popular instrument there? Out. Yeah. All, yeah. all yeah. Appalachia. Yeah. 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 Appalachia, yeah. But, you know, you bring up a good point is, is, <clears throat> is I talk about this with our clients all the time at, uh, at Crossroads is, is, um, is a lot of people don't understand because the, the term Zen is, is, um, is enlightenment through self-awareness, right? Which it makes it different than the 12 steps group, 12 step groups. Cause you're not looking for spiritual contact through a deity, right? So the whole idea of Zen is finding enlightenment through your own self-discovery. And I always tell clients, cause they're like, I don't know what that means. And I'm like, you do know what that means because anybody that's ever been locked in a cell or that's ever been, you know, arrested and put in a cell. When you sit there, you become very Zen like. Mm-hmm. You really have enlightenment through self awareness. You really do look at the priorities and what you want in life, and everything becomes so pure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're so mm-hmm. focused. You're like, yeah. you know what I've always wanted to do? I've always wanted to watch the sunset, or you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> when you're locked up, hey, your priorities are clear, who you love is clear, what you miss is clear. Yeah. And I think it's, 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 you bring up a good point is like when you like kind of what I talked about earlier is when you're surrendered sometimes yeah, um, and somebody takes your power and says, you're going to stay here and sit still, your mind will find a way to make the best of it. And I think that's what you're talking about. You yeah. know, like I'm going to play the banjo or other people are like, I'm going to write a letter to people I really love while I'm in jail. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. The problem is, is can you keep that focus and can you stay surrendered to yourself when you get out? Right. So my question to you is, how many times have you played the banjo <laughs> since you've been off house arrest? I, I played it afterwards, but since I've been running and since Let's, I've been yeah, doing... Twice. Let's back that question up and say, yeah. when was the last time yeah. you played the banjo? And remember, oh, wow. Caleb knows Jesus, it's so don't really lie. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, baby. Push me down in front of Jesus. That's right, got a direct line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's been a while, yeah. yeah. But, um, but, th- but that is it, right? You found something that like really brings you joy and then, you know, and, and something you were proud of doing. But then when you get out and you get those distractions, that's what happens to our clients. Like they, yeah. they really prioritize and, and they're, they give up the drugs. I'm never going to do it again. Then when you get out, life hits you and then you're like, I'm too busy to play the banjo yeah. or I'm going to use. Do you know what I mean? And so I'm just teasing. If you. I can just learn how to run and play the banjo at the same time. Yeah, I feel like Caleb's running ruined your banjo career. <laughs> it did. It did. Take the banjo on the road, baby. Yeah, yeah it might have helped it, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it even that good. You could drop a no. beat and she could play. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And that's what I was talking about, about in group tonight was like um, that isolation piece, like forcing myself to work towards that level of awareness. By yeah, like, yeah. By like just reading and studying the Dharma and yeah. uh, w- listening to Dharma talks and things like that. Problem was, is I didn't know, like, I didn't know where to stop, right? I, did, I allowed it yeah. to, like, fester and go on yeah. and on and on for so long that, like, I wasn't open to new relationships. I wasn't open to um, other pathways to recovery. I wasn't open to ev- to the world. I was so, just, like, I was, I was clinging to what worked and, for me. And that could happen. So Sheena's the same way. She's really an introvert, right? And so I think that could happen is 
you have the Zen can be very like it's something that you could be you could just isolate and it could mm-hmm. become a solo journey. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's why monks, you know, you look at the four noble truths and desire can be destroyed. You're like, of course, I'll shave my head, wear a robe, not talk to anybody. Vow celibacy. Va- yeah, vow <laughs> I'm not going to talk. Um, but Christianity is different because it's about, you know, it's about helping others and, and being a part of the world and going out. And, and so is, you know, in, in a different way. But uh, it really, you, you truly put your spirituality to a test when you throw yourself into the chaos of society. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. nothing's like getting, like when you're really in this good spiritual place and then some guy cuts you off while he's driving and calls oh, you a name. Yeah. Like, F you, you B word. And then you're like, <laughs> Oh God! Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> here comes the default case. I will, and, yeah, I will turn yeah. the other cheek. But you don't know who I was back in the <laughs> day. <laughs> I was just talking about that yeah. today. About my dog getting stolen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody yeah. took my dog and held her for ransom because of who I'd pay. And yeah. I was just talking about that man. In fact, it been two years ago. Oh, I'd been on them. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's hard to say because you want it, and and that's what we talk to our clients about too. You you. Either you fly that flag or you don't fly that flag. That is a dangerous thing. You can't yeah. all of a sudden go back into gangster mode and be like, <laughs> back in the day, my name was Little Puppet. Ask around about me. I'll shoot you. Do you know what I mean? Or whatever your name was. Yeah. But, um, but you're right. You're right. Like You do want to fly that flag. And I always tell our clients, I go, if you become a functioning member of society, sooner or later, you'll become victim to somebody that is like you are now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, probably sooner than later. Yeah, right? probably yeah. sooner than later. Like, on the way out here, yeah. we got a call that somebody took all the copper out of our recovery house. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> so yeah, that's so, like, we, I mean, we just ironic. rolled off our back. Like, okay, yeah. that was us. I don't know how many times. You yeah. Know? <laughs> when we moved into the gym, all the copper was gone. Oh, really? Yeah, like it was like we looked at the building. We're like, that's not a bad building. Then we came back. There's holes in the wall. The copper is gone. <laughs> yeah. It's not funny, but it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you do like... You chalk it up to the game, right? Yeah. Like when you're in addiction, so you got to chalk it up to the got game. To. The, the big difference now is I'm insured. Like, I'm like, <laughs> chalk it up to the, you know. Uh, yeah. What's those guys Back on up. TV? They're like, we know something because we've seen a few things. Yeah. Or two, you know, chalk it up. Call those guys. But back in the day, you would have just been like, now I got to come up. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Now I got to go steal someone else's copper. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, but you are good. Good, Caleb. Sorry. No, no I'm good. <laughs> All right, I, I thought you were going to say something. No, huh? But yeah, it, it is like that. Like you said, somebody wrongs you and you're like, two years, if you knew the old Rob, you know, and it's hard, it's hard to, it's, I always feel like it's hard to keep that, that person down because, because what makes the addicted you so powerful is nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. And when you're in addiction and you have nothing to lose, like you're fearless. Because, you know, there would be times mm-hmm. I'd be like, so this dude's going to beat you up. I'm like, Psh. I want to die. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, put me out of my misery. Right. And that makes you very dangerous. Now that I have so much to lose, I mean, like, I'm soft as medicated cotton, you know? Like, <laughs> dude wants to fight me. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm still paying on these teeth, dude. Don't hit right. me. Like, yeah. I'm not trying to get punched. These are expensive. My insurance doesn't cover cosmetic. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I don't want to be locked up now. Yeah. Like, right. You know, I mean, back in the day, you get locked up. You're like, man, it feels good to eat three meals. Now yeah, I'm like, like I'm uh, I do intermittent fasting. So can I just have my meals before three? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't handle it now. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's I think it's good to have something to lose. I wanted to ask you, you talked about um, getting into running. Yeah. And early recovery and doing yeah. some like long distance running and stuff like that. How did, at what point did you like incorporate the CrossFit stuff? Because like that seems to be, we were talking earlier to some folks yeah. uh, in the gym and they were talking, oh, C- Caleb's a runner. Oh, no, I don't want nothing yeah. to do with that. He was like, there, does, there doesn't seem, and I'm not familiar with any of this stuff, so I might be talking yeah. about shit I don't even know, but like there doesn't seem to be like a lot, a good blend between the two communities. So, so, so like how did you do that? So, this is what we did. I was so ignorant and, and bright eyed and bushy tailed when we first started Addict to Athlete. Um, we put an ad in the paper that said, Well, running's, we, my thought was running's cheap and everybody could do it. So, I put an you ad. You don't have to have a place yeah, to do it. Yeah, you don't have to have yeah. a place to do it. Uh, I put an ad in the paper that said, We'll have a meeting on the football field at this middle school and then we'll run around the track, right? That was not good because then drug addicts, drug dealers started showing up at the track when the program got bigger, you know, and talking to the girls out there in recovery. And it's just too hard. They do drive by 
insulting like crackheads and drive by while we're in a circle in the middle of this football field. And so we started realizing, and then it snowed and I, we were like, oh, we got to take it inside. But the reason we strayed from running is because uh, if Caleb's been sober for six months and he's just running six minute miles and then I come in and I run 13 minute miles and you're running for your recovery and I'm running for my recovery, it was like none of the faster people wanted to wait for the newcomers. Like they were like, this is my time to run fast and, and be do, do this. And the newcomers were like, felt like, you know, well, I can't keep up with them, so I don't want to come anymore. Mm-hmm. Everybody there's fast. So what we moved to is when we started renting the bottom of this gym, we moved to insanity because we all got insanity certified. And we were like, if you do the insanity workout, we're all working out together and we're all stopping together. Right. Do you know what I mean? So it was like, Caleb, if you could do 100 jumping jacks in 30 seconds, do it. If I could do 10, do it. But we're all a team. We're all sweating together. We're working together. Nobody's marginalized. Everybody's just, co- you know, good. we're a good fit. Then we met Scott from Phoenix, um, from the Phoenix. And Scott was all about CrossFit. And he had one of his guys, Root Martinez, who moved down here. And Root started coaching with Addict to Athlete. And he's like, you guys should really get into CrossFit. And so we kind of got into the CrossFit model over Insanity because without weights and without, you know, kettle, you know, kettlebells and pull-up bars, there was not that many options. You could only do so much insanity before everybody's like, it's the same thing. So now with CrossFit, yeah, it's constant. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So now with CrossFit, it's constantly varied. We could do insanity one day. We could do whatever the next day. So take us back to, uh, your first meeting, Rob, like who showed up, how many people, what did you think? What was you, what was going through you and Shana's mind at that time? So, Sheena wasn't really like, she was like, what are you doing? Do you know what I mean? (laughs) So I read this article and it said, it was in runner's world. And it said from addict to athlete. And it was, it said from addict to, from athlete to addict to athlete. That's what it said. So it was about a guy that was a runner in college. He got hurt and got addicted to opiates. And then he was back to being an athlete. So I like, I was like, wow, addict to (laughs) athlete. That's really a cool thing. So I just took the first addict mm-hmm. out and just use the addict to athlete. And, um, so I put that out in the paper and the first guy that came was a guy from the state hospital. And he is, uh, he was there for some pretty serious crimes. And he was like, this is my first time out of the hospital in like five years. Can you sign my paper? And, and that I was here at the meeting and I was like, Holy, it's the first meeting, the first meeting, <laughs> the first guy, <laughs> the first guy, this guy that was like, had been locked up. And they let him out to come to this program. They read the article in the paper. And, uh, and I was like, dude, I got me. <laughs> like, you know, I guess I'll sign your paper. I didn't know what I was doing, you know. And uh, that guy was with us for a long time. He did a lot of races and stuff. And he ended up uh, leaving the state hospital and, and doing well. But, uh, you know, we had a lot of people show up for that first meeting. Like, what's this going to be about? And we were standing out in this football field. And it was it was exciting and scary and fun and but then it was a lot of responsibility and, and a lot of anxiety also and everything that could go wrong went wrong in our first couple of years of course yeah so uh but but it was it was the first i'll never forget the first time we did it she was like are people really going to do this every saturday do we have to do this every saturday you know and now <laughs> she loves it you know now she yeah. she runs it that's and what I'm i was gonna ask yeah. where where's that line whenever she she was like Finally stepped into where she's at. So when I made the, so when addict athletes started to grow and I, and I started realizing, you know, through my job that I, and, and through the leadership in my, in my employment, they were like, you're going to have to make a choice sooner or later. Like you're, you're moving through our organization fast and addict athletes growing fast. One's going this way. One's going this way. Do you want to be a clinician or do you want to be a peer support specialist? You know, you're going to have to figure that out. And uh, like I said, I chose to go the path of education. And so when I stepped away in 2016, uh, we, we had a board meeting and I resigned and they voted, the board asked Sheena, they're like, do you want to be a part of this? And, and so Sheena was like, pretty straight up, she's like, well, Rob casts a big shadow <coughs> and it's always going to be the Rob program. Sound familiar? Yeah. And she was like, yeah. <laughs> and she was like, why are you smirking? Yeah, me? and so she was like, "My um, shadow's big." So, so basically, <laughs> she, right, right. she was like, uh, she was like, and then kind of just told the board, like, "Rob's got to be out. 
Like, you guys got to 86 him. If he's resigning, <laughs> he's got to be gone. Your wife cut and you yeah, out. Yeah, she cut me out. <laughs> and so, and she was like, you know, I need to be the leader. I need to be the face. I need to be the one making the decisions. So even in our marriage and at home, it would seem like, and I know like people are like, I know behind closed doors, you guys talk about that. We don't. Sheena's the boss. Like, I mean, she might bounce stuff off of me, but I don't get involved in it. When people from uh, treatment centers call me and they go, hey, I'm trying to get a hold of addict athlete. I go, you need to call Sheena, dude. I have nothing to do with it. I literally don't know what they're doing. Sheena will be like, we're working with kids. Did you know that? I'm like, no. Like, I really don't know what she's doing. And the crazy thing that happened with that program is the females in addict athlete have become way stronger. And when I was the leader of addict athlete, we definitely had more males. Now the females, Kaylee's one of the coaches, the females, yeah, you know, awesome. everybody that was in spin. Yeah. 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 A lot of the people in yeah. spin were uh, in recovery. Not everybody there was in recovery. Right. Some of them are from sick, but it's female. Uh, there's a lot more females. Than males. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so she, with Sheena being in charge of it and being the face <laughs> of it, uh, pound for pound, the girls that come to, to her, to her gym and her classes, the women are more fit than the men. And she just has stepped into that leadership role and, and, and I've watched it evolve. And I think so now that she's like m- tailored it to what she wanted it to be and it's not what I wanted it to be, like it's, she's all in. And it, it's, it, it's definitely taken a different mm-hmm. role too. Do you know what I mean? It's like addict athlete isn't what I thought. What I envisioned it to be is different than the way it is now. But it's great because Sheena's the leader and she's the one making those decisions with the board of directors. Um, awesome. I just want to, Talk about uh, just how inspiring and, and powerful that was to see people that was on probation and parole that and to have so their awesome. a parole officer sitting in here with them. Some of them working out. Working out that? with them, being a part of this program. Talk yeah. about that. How did you, that... You can't find that in many places. No. no. Uh-uh. <laughs> how did that happen and how did you approach... So so probation has very different roles, right? So when the when the when So when there's the class for just probation, the officers aren't there... I wish they would be there, and hopefully someday they will be. But um, Nikki Golub, who's a probation officer, helped me develop the curriculum and was really an advocate. And David Semental, the probation officer here, he was a big advocate of, of, this, uh, of alternative programming. And so when we wrote the curriculum, we started working, on, crim- yeah. we started working on criminogenic needs uh, as a way to treat recovery, and I actually did my thesis on that in, okay. in college in my master's program. And then parole got involved with, and I didn't even know about that. Sheena did that all on her own. She got a contract with parole. And then parole had a different idea. They said, we're going to bring the parole officers in to work out with the clients to show that the clients are invested, that the officers are invested in their clients. So with the parole classes, the parole officers come in. And so the probation people that graduate the program, they could do whatever they want because once they graduate that program, the way Sheena has it set up is they could come forever for free. And so the probation clients will come into the parole class and they'll sit in or they'll come every, whenever they can. So it's, it just kind of happened where parole wanted the officers there and probation didn't want the officers there. So it just is uh, really just different approaches on how they approach it. But probation is what gave addict athlete their, their original start. And probation and parole are the biggest advocates for treatment um, at Crossroads. I would say a large percentage of the clients that are referred to our programs and what we specialize in is offender services. And so we're not just treating addiction. We're treating behaviors, decision making, all of that. How had I mean, uh, I watched that live that you said was taken down. Yeah. And I, I like that piece where you was talking about harm reduction in the probation office. Yeah. And how the probation officers you're trying to to get them to change their way of thinking, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, towards harm reduction. Can you talk about that a little well, bit? Well, yeah. So we started talking about these probation officers, and and uh, probation in Pueblo is very progressive. They're way ahead of their time. And, I mean, way ahead of the rest of the country. Mm-hmm. But nobody's getting locked up for hot UAs. All the jails are full. They're not going to lock you up for a hot UA, Right. So we started really taking this harm reduction approach and talking to the chief, David Semental, over at probation and saying, like, look, you would rather have these clients stay in contact with you and have a hot UA and communicate with you that they're struggling than avoid you and not take a UA at all and just disappear. 
So we started talking about either you want them, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to just follow every stipulation of probation? Because if you do that, they're not going to, they're just going to disappear. Mm-hmm. I was like, so either, either we, either you're trying to save a life or you're trying to get them to comply. So do you want them to comply or do you want them, or do you want to save a life? Which is it? Because as long as you want them to comply, they have a restraining order when they're on probation from drugs and alcohol. So they know they're not in compliance when their UA is hot. So now they're not taking UAs, they're not calling their POs, and they're just running the streets. If you take this harm reduction approach, then you're going to help them with treatment, you're going to help meet them where they are, you're going to not give them any hell about their hot UA, and you're going to take a chance at saving a life. Do you know what I mean? So so, so Pueblo, and, and just in general, and David Semental. He was like, you know what? That makes sense. Let's let's really do this. Let's get these clients and let them know that we're here to support them, help them, get them case management. Now, if a client has more than just a hot UA, like if they have those criminal behaviors, they're still in stuff, having police contact, that's a whole different thing. But these clients that are complying, but they just have hot UAs. Just going to their, going just, to their classes. They're going to their class, going every, to their meetings, right. but they have hot UAs. That's, you know, we're just reducing harm. And so I really take my hat off to probation and parole in Pueblo because they are have made a decision to work with Crossroads, to work with treatment agencies, to work with programs like Sheena's NA, Celebrate Recovery, 8A, all those programs, and say, let's meet the clients where they are and see what they want. Do you know now, um, in the probation harm reduction class, they have five weeks to make a decision because probation can't just let them run and gun forever. So for five weeks... They don't give them any hard time over their UAs. They don't. They let them get free needles, whatever they need, in those five weeks. And then after those five weeks, they have to make a decision to have some kind of change. And then once they start progressing towards change, then the officer will le- either, you know, look at revoke and regranting or whatever their path is. But if the client is showing progress and changing, then they'll cut them a break. Is there any kind of data of how that's been? It helping? just started. Just started. It just started. Well, I know for for me, like my in my experience, whenever I was out there running a gun, I don't know how many absconding charges I got. Yeah. Just because I'm like I knew I was doing wrong. I ain't yeah, I ain't yeah. checking in with you. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So what would that look like if we had somebody right. in our community that stepped up and be like, okay, you know, I'm going to work with you. Yeah. 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 Imagine somebody like I, I I got to sit in on one of the harm reduction classes because I try to stay out of it, but I got to sit in on one of them. And the guy was like, what do you need? The guy teaching the class for Crossroads, um, he was like, what do you need? Like, what do you, let's get you some clean needles. Do you want to get methanol? People that are involved in needle exchanges and harm reduction programs, they're like 90% more likely to go to treatment and look for services. Yeah. And so you have somebody that's non-judgmental, that's just helpful, offering you food, water, whatever. We, we went to the harm reduction conference in New Orleans, and there was even a program that gave out meth pipes. Because they said if we give them a meth pipe, they're less likely to shoot, you know, and that's crazy. That seems crazy to me. But if you give them methadone or you give them clean needles, I mean, of course, you're reducing harm, not just to the client, but to society. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you're not spreading MRSA, hepatitis, AIDS. So this whole harm reduction approach is pretty amazing to watch. Somebody just say, what do you need, Caleb? What do you need? And some of the stories we heard at that harm reduction uh, there was a program called Spikes on Bikes. They're going out and giving needles while they're on their bikes. One of the other things we heard was a client who had been involved in harm reduction and said the only person that, that uh, when they were in addiction and homeless, said the only person that talked to me, hugged me, gave me any kind of physical contact in years was the people at the needle exchange. He said, I would go into the needle exchange just to get a hug hello because wow. nobody had even touched my skin in years. Right. And so, like, you hear that, and you're like, they're doing a little more than just giving clean needles. Absolutely. So yes. it's pretty cool. That is. So what? Um, how far along are you with the PhD? Are you almost finished? Like, what's, no. ne- what's next for you? I'm about in the middle. Oh, yeah? Uh, okay. yeah, so I just finished a semester, and, and I'm, my dissertation, I think, is going to be on, um, on the lack of services specific to sexual minorities. Mm-hmm. So, like, uh, in treatment... We're, we try to be culturally competent, but the LGBTQ community and, and uh, transgender people, um, they don't have the same services available to them that the, that the heterosexual people do. So I'm going to try to see like, what those gaps in services look like, if it affects treatment, and, and how can we make it better. 
And then when you're finished, get into advocacy. Yeah, and then when I'm finished, hopefully you keep doing program development. Fortunately, at Crossroads, my job title is, is Executive Dir- Director of Program Development, mm-hmm. and I do the public relations, but I also oversee a couple of the programs. So it's, it's pretty cool that I get to develop some of the programs in the harm reduction, and LEAD was one of them. Yeah, we just got That's a LEAD awesome. program in yeah. Western right. North Carolina. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So before we wrap this thing up, yep. We've been going for like an hour. Yeah, yeah. Past your, t- past your, I know. Past your bedtime. Street lights are on. I got to yeah. go home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you take this guy in a race, man? No. You can't swimming, hang? not swimming. a bike. He'll smash I, I, would put, I would put myself against Caleb swimming, maybe on a bike, but uh, I definitely can't outrun <laughs> Caleb. Uh, I, I would probably say in a 5K, he would be a good four minutes ahead of me, I bet. I'm old, though. I'm 46. How old are you, Caleb? That don't, no, it's not. Uh, I'm just saying, how old are you? <laughs> I'll be 33 at the end of the month. He's a young man. Yeah. So when I was 33, <laughs> no, I'm just I, I was running four minute miles. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I got a story to share with you, Rob. So one of the first times that I ever hung out with Caleb, like more than just friends, um, <laughs> we're uh, chilling, laying on a bed, and he pulls up something on his phone and he's like check this out i mean i'm talking one of our first dates ever yeah. and he starts showing me addict to athlete Aww. check out what these guys are doing in colorado that's <laughs> that's been, yeah that was like, like back in the first, i mean I, just when you were talking yeah. about like yeah. how when you first started it and sheena and everything she was like what are you doing you know caleb i mean he's just full throttle all the time yeah that was back in uh <laughs> September, October of 17. Yeah. 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 That's, That's about the time when we met Tom, like right yeah. now. Well, so I love what y'all are cool. doing. Man. No, no. Hey, Sheena's doing it all, man. And, and I. Well, you, and, I yeah. mean, in, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. from the uh, policy perspective. And yeah. Yeah. PhD and just, yeah. You know. Well, you'll get to go to Crossroads tomorrow, which I'm yeah. really excited for you to meet our clients and see. Crossroads serves 22 counties. And so, wow. like, just any kind of services or great speakers like you that we could bring in to share your story. Because those clients do get to come to Addict Athlete and meet with Sheena and, and work out on the program on Saturday. So it's good that they get exposed. to They get to go to Celebrate Recovery. They, like I said, they get to go to all these different programs. So I'm excited for you to go speak tomorrow and see, like, because the people in treatment, I think <laughs> anytime we could show them what other people who came from where they were at can do something positive. But I want to say this. It is weird that you were, like, uh, hooking up for the first time and then looking at pictures <laughs> of us. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Like, yeah. Having an intimate moment. Yeah. Hey, check these guys yes. out. <laughs> hey, this is the first time we kissed. Have I ever showed you this? <laughs> no, I'm just For real. <laughs> I thought you were going to be like, oh, the God. first time we ever hung out is more than friends. He's like, I run six minute miles. <laughs> 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 Smooth brother. His Garmin Connect. Uh-huh. <laughs> Have I showed you my Garmin Connect app? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but uh, Caleb, I just want to say this. Thank you guys for yeah. coming out. I, I really like think it's awesome i'm excited for you to come to crossroads tomorrow i know sheena was honored to have you guys here i look forward to you and hopefully sheena working together and and hopefully when my book comes out uh writing about you and our book too like the way tom did and and uh hats off to tom for uh you know for sharing so shout out shout out to tom shout out to tom spiritual Um, spiritual adrenaline Get his book. Um, it's better for you to read his book than have him read it to you because Tom's not that excited. <laughs> no, oh, no. I'm just kidding, Tom. Oh, Tom no. is the most tanned, muscular man I've he ever is. met in my he's life. Ador- he's adorable. Do you ever notice that on, on Tom's... Sh- Tom, is it me or is Tom's shorts getting smaller and smaller? <laughs> they are. Pictures? I was like, what's going on? He's smashing You're his competition. Amazing, yeah, yeah, you are, Tom. Yeah. You're yeah, amazing. We love you, Tom. We love Tom. <clears throat> and we're grateful for the hospitality, man, for no, taking care yeah, of no, us. No, no, no. Awesome. welcome over there. Yeah. It was just wonderful, dude. Man, cool. this has been an awesome first podcast for us, taking yeah. it on the road for real. Yeah. Cool. Hey, dude, you, you're yeah. super well-spoken, man. You ever thought about doing your own podcast? Uh, no. Oh, come <laughs> on, bro. I can't add anything else, man. I, I, <laughs> bought, I bought six pairs of shoelaces to put in my shoes, the kinds you don't tie, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I cannot make time to put those damn shoelaces I gotcha, in. I got you. I got you. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, anyways, man, grateful for your Go check them out. Add it to Athlete. Add it to Athlete. Crossroads Turning Points. Crossroads yes. Turning yes. Points. Y'all have a good night. Take care. All right. Thanks.